What's up everybody? I'm Tim from Timber Ridge Gifts. So this video is going to be talking all about frosting. Uh, that annoying little white stuff that forms on our candles that we've all most likely seen at some point or another. So this video is going to be all about what it is, how to prevent it, and what we can do to fix it when it does form. First let's talk about what it is. Uh, we all call it frosting because it kind of looks like frosted glass. The actual technical scientific term for it is polymorphism. Well, let's talk about what that means real quick. Uh, first, let me credit all the science that I've learned for this video uh, to a paper written by a man named Dr. Jana, who actually wrote his doctoral thesis on the crystallization of vegetable waxes. Now, I'll leave the link if you guys want to check it out, but I'll warn you, it's pretty boring, pretty much only interesting to people like me, and it's 200 pages. But not to worry, I'm going to give you the abridged uh, country boy version. So polymorphism or polymorphic basically means the ability to take on different shapes while still retaining the same chemical composition. To understand that a little bit, let's talk about what soy wax actually is. Soybeans are processed, pressed, and refined ultimately to form a hydrogenated soybean oil. That hydrogenated soybean oil is basically composed of triglycerides, which are collections of fatty acids. Now in their cooled state, these triglycerides crystallize form into a solid state, and basically become what we've come to love and know as soybean wax. You guys bored yet? Well, here's where it starts to come together. These triglycerides are polymorphic, which means that they can form in different shapes while still retaining the same chemical composition. And the problem for us is these triglycerides like to form crystals at different temperatures. Uh, so along comes the frosting issue. Your candles cool it at different temperatures, causing the triglycerides to crystallize at different temperatures giving you the different look. So in layman's terms, your candle cooled unevenly, so you got different crystal formations. Now we're here at this side of the candle, cooled nice and evenly, and gave us this nice smooth finished look that we're looking for. Over here, for whatever reason, this part of the candle cooled at a different temperature, and gave us this type of crystal formation, resulting in our frosting. So to sum that up without being too boring, the soy wax is polymorphic, meaning that it crystallizes as it cools at different temperatures. As it cools at different temperatures, it's going to form different type of crystals in our glass, causing that noticeable frosting. So that's the main factor that's going to cause your frosting. Let's talk about a few others that can either lessen it or contribute to it. First one is going to be the type of wax sheet. Now this molecular reaction is endemic with all types of soy waxes. It's basically just the nature of the beast with soy waxes. But there are some blends that have been put together to try to help reduce the effects of the frosting. Basically just a proprietary blend of soy wax and other additives, and we'll touch on a few of those later. So while this can help, it's never really going to fully take away the problem because this is what soy wax does. No matter what you add to it, soy wax is going to be soy wax. Another contributing factor can be the type of fragrance oil that you're using. Um, basically some can be more viscous or thicker than others causing the soy wax to, re to react differently as you move from one candle scent to the other. Next contributing factor is going to be the size and type of the container that you're using. The smaller the container, the faster and more unevenly it's going to cool. Just because of the volume of melted wax we're going to pour into both of these, this one's going to cool a lot slower and hopefully more evenly than this one will. Next factor is going to be the uh, temperature. Whether it be the temperature outside, the ambient air temperature where you're making your candles, and can even be something as simple as heat produced by different light sources that are close to your candles. Especially with the smaller candles, um, soy wax is already finicky enough. You start dumping all these other factors on top of it, and it just creates more and more hassle, which is going to cause the frosting. And there are some additives that you can add to your candle wax that can help reduce the effects of frosting. You'll never completely eliminate it, but some additives can beat it back just a little bit. Additives such as stearic acid, bybar, coconut wax, uh, UV inhibitors. I'm not going to get too in-depth on additives right now because that would make the video too long. I'm actually going to do a separate video on additives later, so you guys make sure you look for that. But don't get too excited and think that, that's, and think that additives are the magic bullet. Because if you're buying a uh, pre-processed blend of soy wax, Chances are it's already crammed full of additives anyway, so they're already in there. Adding more on your own is not going to help the issue. And the last factor that can affect the frosting is our actual pouring temperature. Now we just established earlier that the frosting is actually caused by the cooling temperature. So it would make sense that actually is the biggest factor that can make or break whether our candle is covered up in frosting. Now it works out for us that this is the main factor because this is really the only factor that we can control. Our fragrances are going to be what they're going to be. The candle side, the candle jar we use is going to be what it's going to be. Not really a whole lot we can do about ambient temperatures. And chemists have already chalked our wax full of additives, so there's no point trying to top their work. So pouring temperature is really the only avenue we have left 
to try to control the frosting issue. But sadly, there's no magic number. If you ask 50 different people, you'd get 50 different answers. But the general accepted range is pouring anywhere between 100 degrees and 130. The general idea being that if you pour your wax cool, it has less cooling to do in the container and it can cool more even. Now, I'm sorry I can't give you a more exact number, a more, a more direct formula, but with all the other factors in play and the finicky nature of soy wax to begin with, it's really the best it's going to get. Even if you do find a process that works for you, soy wax is such a pain that that process you're using will work great for a month or so, then all of a sudden just for no reason it'll quit working, you'll get frosting every time, and you'll be scrambling trying to figure out what's going on and trying to change things up. Oh, and did I mention that the polymorphism can continue even after the candle's cooled? Uh, as the candle sits on the shelf, as temperature changes happen to that finished candle, those triglyceride molecules can change and form different types of crystals. So even though your candle's perfect to begin with, after it sits on the shelf for about a month, temperature changes are going to have affected it, and you're going to have that frosting issue. So now that you've got a better scientific understanding of why it's actually happening, hopefully that can at least help you to live with it, maybe try to beat it back just a little bit. But for your own sanity, you're better off just accepting it and realizing that there's nothing you can do to fully 100% prevent it. So with that being said, we also have to know how to fix it. So to do that, we're going to need a heat gun. Now you can use a hair dryer. It's going to take you forever and a day. So do yourself a favor and buy a heat gun. These are not expensive. You can get them at the hardware store, at Walmart or Target, anywhere from $10 to $15. It's not a huge investment and it's going to save you a lot of headache. Definitely something every candle shop should have. And a few extras you can have to make your life a little bit easier. It's going to be a good set of, uh, honestly I don't know what these are called. I call them jar tongs. Uh, I bought them in the canning section of Walmart. They're for moving uh, hot jars around. It's basically what I've got when I'm done with it. Just picks it up from the top. Makes it a lot easier to carry and move around. Also pick up some type of a little turntable. Just going to make your life a lot easier rather than having to constantly touch the jar. You can just kind of spin it and hit it with your heat gun as you go. Makes it a lot easier to work. Any gun will work. Either a metal one or possibly a ceramic or a granite one would work a lot better. I was smart enough to buy a wooden one and really wasn't planning ahead that wood plus a really hot heat gun is going to start little fires if you're not careful. But I found an easy fix. I can just take one of my candle molds, set it on top of it, put the candle there works just as well. So now basically we're just going to take our heat gun and heat our candle to get all that frosting to go away. There's a bit of a process to it though, so let's zoom in and I'll show you guys how I do it. So as you can see, we've got our frosted candle there. we got a little bit of frosting there. Now the mistake most people make is they'll just hit this area with the heat gun. Uh, warming that area up will cause that bit of frosting to go away. Uh, the problem that that's going to cause though is you're going to have an uneven distribution of heat on this side of the candle. Remember that the different crystals like to form at different temperatures. So by just heating that one spot, we've created a huge temperature differential as that spot moves out. So it's going to be really hot here. As it moves out, it's going to get cooler and cooler. So ultimately what you're going to have is a huge temperature differential right here in this one spot. So the end result is you're going to cause more frosting than what you started with. So to truly correct the issues that we're having here, we're going to have to heat the entire outer edge of the candle. So if you can picture it in your head, this outer edge of the candle, we probably want to melt maybe an eighth of an inch of that. Just enough to have a nice layer of molten wax around the outside of the jar. Uh, hopefully that's going to get it all to the same temperature. So when it cools, it's going to cool without any frosting. So basically to do that, we're just going to hit it with our heat gun. We're going to slowly turn it on our turntable, trying to get the heat as evenly dispersed as we can. We don't want to focus too much in one area because that can potentially uh, overheat and crack our glass. You can tell it's working because you'll see the wax changing to a darker color and you'll see those crystals going away. Uh, basically where it's formed different crystals, it's left a little air pocket in there so you'll actually see the air bubbles rising to the top. So we'll know we're done when all the air bubbles are gone and it appears to be melted evenly around the entire outer edge of the candle. It's going to look something like this. You can see at this point it's gone away, and this is where most people would stop. The problem is we've got an uneven dispersion of heat on this side of the glass. So as this recools, it's going to cool at different temperatures. 
and it's going to cause more frost than we started. So we've got to keep going until we heat the entire outer edge of the candle. You guys can see those air bubbles rising to the top. That is the air pockets that were left when the different type of crystals formed. As we heat it, we're just going to let those rise to the top. You can see I'm using a nice even sweeping motion rather than just focusing it on one area. Just helps even the heat out a little bit and keep one section of glass from getting overheated and cracking. You can still do this on a candle that already has a label. Of course you want to be careful not to get it too close to the label and actually burn the paper. But if we hit it from either side, do a little bit of sweeping motion over the top and bottom of it, trying to stay directly off the label but heating the area around it as much as we can, we can still accomplish what we need to do. Looks to be about done. I'm just going to give the whole candle just one more once over just to try to even out that heat a little bit. Okay, it's all evenly heated. The air bubbles are coming up. Just to finish it up, we're going to give one last blast of heat to the top. Now we're done. We're ready to pull this off, set it to the side to cool, Move on to the next candle if we have other candles to deal with. Now that we're done with this one, we're ready to move it to the side and work on any other candles if we have to. To do that, we're just going to take our jar tongs, get a nice firm grip, move it off to the side. I always like to give it a few taps just to free up any air bubbles that might still be trapped in there. And hopefully that'll cool nice and evenly and we won't have any more frosting issues on this candle. Now sometimes depending on how bad the candle actually was, you might have to repeat this process at least once, sometimes even twice if it's really bad. So a question I get is, does this affect the uh, scent throw of the candle? Well, you are melting it. I can smell it. So I'm sure a little bit of the uh, fragrance oil with the scent has burned off. I don't have a spectrometer or anything to be able to measure exactly what's coming off of the candle. We can assume that it's losing a little bit of the uh, scent throw. So it's going to be a trade-off you're going to have to live with. Uh, do you want that perfectly colored candle with no frosting? that has a tiny bit less fragrance oil in it? Or do you want the stronger candle that has that unappealing look? Hopefully this video was helpful. If nothing else, you learned a new word today. Polymorphism. But hopefully with a better understanding of what it is, what causes it, a few things we can do to try to prevent it, and definitely how we can fix it when it does happen, it can make your candle making a lot less frustrating. I will leave you with one final thought. Um, like I've said a few times in this video, it's the nature of the beast with soy wax, so there's going to come a point where you just have to embrace it, accept it, and learn to live with it. In fact, some people have learned to actually use it as a selling point. Um, what they tell their customers is, you know this is a 100% soy wax candle because only soy wax will cause that frosting. So if you see that frosting in my candles, you'll know you're getting a 100% soy wax candle. If you guys look in the description, you'll see that put very eloquently in written form. So if you guys want to check that out, feel free to use that. Happy candle making. Good luck with your frosting issues. You guys, make sure you subscribe to my channel. Turn on the notifications. Stay tuned for more great videos. Thanks for watching, everybody.